evening. Welcome to the April 27th meeting of the Dover Sherburn, Dover and Sherburn School Committees. My name is Kate Potter and I'm standing in tonight for Nancy Cordell who couldn't be with us. I would like to call this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being conducted remotely consistent with the session law signed by Governor Baker on February 15th, 2022 extending until July 15th, 2022, the remote meeting provisions of the March 12th, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. This open meeting is being conducted remotely. Information on how to join remote school committee meetings and meeting agendas are posted on the Dover Sherburn District website. Please note that this meeting is being recorded please be aware that anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Before I read the public comment preamble, may I ask if anyone is here for public comment, could you please raise your hands? Sarah, maybe if you can help me look. Not seeing any virtual hands. I'm just scrolling through the screens to see if anyone has a physical hand raised. I don't see any, Kate. Okay, thank you, I don't either. Okay, then um, seeing no public comment, I would like to move forward um, to our first agenda item which is the sustainability task force update. Yes, thank you. And I apologize, my camera is malfunctioning tonight. So you'll be able to hear me, but not see me. But we're thrilled tonight. Um, we sort of have a three part um, presentation for the school committees tonight on sustainability, on the topic of sustainability. Uh, we're gonna kick off with um, an update from the sustainability task force, which as you know, I took over um, in place of Dr. Keogh and my co-chair, student co-chair this year is Angela Lynn, who um, I believe was on the Zoom last year. And if you've been to any of the open hearings um, throughout this season, you will have also seen her as a student uh, presenter and she'll talk a little bit about the work they've been doing there. So uh, the subcommittee chairs of the Sustainability Task Force will be presenting. Uh, next up, we are bringing in, um, sort of looking at the town initiatives involving the school. So tonight join us are Dorothea Von Herder and Gino Carlucci, who are both uh, sustainability coordinators in Sherburn. Uh, Gino also has been doing some work um, over the many years with the town of Dover on green community. So we'll be looking at what the towns are doing that involves the school. And then I'll just sort of close the um, sustainability um, agenda item by talking about some of the things that we're currently doing here um, on the campuses that are, are all in with the goal of um, you know sustainability. So I'm going to turn it over to Angela to uh, kick off the students' presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Angela. Awesome. Cool. You guys can all see my screen. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I'll just give um, a little introduction to the Sustainability Task Force and our work this year. So we are an environmental group of students, faculty members, community members, you know, really anyone in the community who's interested. And um, our mission is to encourage conservation, spread awareness about environmental issues to our schools and communities and create institutionalized change. So our task force is breaking up into subcommittees. This is just so that students can focus on their interest areas and really choose projects that they're passionate about. We have the water subcommittee, um, food subcommittee, politics subcommittee, housing and transportation subcommittee, and education subcommittee. So each group will kind of do their own work and then we'll meet as a group um, about every month to just check in and see if we can help each other out on our initiatives. Um, so, yes, my name is Sasha. Um, I'm a member of the water subcommittee. I work with Angela. Um, and so this year, we have worked with the middle school environment citizen action groups um, on their service project. We've piloted a project to renovate the linguist bathrooms uh, to make them more water and energy efficient. 
This includes installing motion activated faucets, hand dryers, and more water efficient toilets. We worked with Sean McGee, who's the building manager, and applied for a grant through the Allen Mudge Foundation. We also spoke at a Charles River Watershed Association webinar. And in the past two years, we've compiled educational resources on a variety of topics. Some upcoming work that we will be doing uh, is creating educational material on the watershed and the water cycle for Pine Hill Elementary School. Um, this summer, we'll be working with Julie Dreyfus, a Pine Hill parent, to create posters, sites, and other learning materials for students at Pine Hill to use. Thank you. Um, here is what the Housing and Transportation Subcommittee has been up to. I know uh, members from that group aren't able to be here today, so I'll just like give a little spiel on what they're doing. Earlier this year, they hosted a webinar on how to cut um, your carbon footprint. They presented on environmentally friendly lifestyles and nutrition, electric cars or EVs, and housing. And they, uh, David Green, who is a community member, um, presented on that section because he has um, a net zero home and you know he talks all about that. And so it was really great to have uh, the students share and also for David Green to kind of give his side of it. The politics subcommittee um, wrote climate emergency declarations for Dover and Sherborne. Um, it was for the students, at least it was our first time um, interacting with politics in the local government. And I'm happy to say it has mostly been a positive experience. Dover's Board of Selectmen will make a statement about the article at Dover's upcoming town meeting. And I have great news, which is that yesterday, Sherborne's climate emergency declaration passed with a vote of 96 to 10. So just really happy about that and you know proud of everyone's work. In the education subcommittee, um, they're really working to support all the other subcommittees. They create educational materials, um, content, and just, just things that can support all the other work of the um, other subcommittees. What I have on the side is just like a quick flyer that Catherine Whittle, who is a member of the education subcommittee and was actually the leader of the task force last year, she created this to support Sherborne's climate emergency declaration. And so they really work to just create content that will help um, all the other subcommittees. So the food subcommittee worked with the director of food services on reinstating the composting program which had to be shut down due to COVID. And they were hoping to um, add to their pollinator garden this year, but unfortunately that did not work out, but they're hoping to work with the middle school CAGS next year on doing that. And they're also interested in setting up a table at Dover Days to promote and sell pollinator friendly and native plants. And so those are all of our subcommittees. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more, you can just check out our site here. It is very long. So instead you can just type in DS Sustainability Task Force into Google. And then the first option that pops up is our website. So I would recommend doing that and not memorizing this long link. But other than that, thank you so much for having us here tonight. I'm really happy to be able to share and um, I guess look forward to our work in the future. Thank you. Great. And it's been an extreme pleasure um, to add this on my daily plate to do is to work with these students. As you can see, they're um, so dedicated and are um, beyond their age and what they're doing for the community. And so it's, it's been a great experience. Um, before I let the students go and study hard for all their um, uh, test and homework, uh, does the school committee have any questions for the students on, this, on the task force? Uh, Maggie? Um, so first, I want to say thank you so much um, to Angela and to all of you who um, spend all your so much time and energy. I, I've been going through the um, website a little bit over the last couple of days, and, and you've really put a lot of work into all the background. As you, um, Angela, are you, you're a junior, right? Oh, I'm actually a sophomore. Oh, so. sophomore. oh you're a sophomore. Yeah. Great. We have you for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. So if you think about the years coming and for our eighth grade student, um, for Natasha as well, as you think about the years coming up, what do you have any big goals or things that you would like to see the group tackle? And is there anything that we as school committees can do to support you in that work? Yeah. 
So with the eighth graders, we've worked with them this year um, through the environmental CAGS, and we're really lucky to have such a large group of students in that. I think next year it'll be exciting to have, you know, all those students, hopefully a good amount of them will join our group and then we can create a good, you know, feeder system into this group since it's relatively new. Um, I think in the future, it's really just educating students more and helping them um, find opportunities to create more change. I think through this group, I've been very fortunate to um, you know, be given so many opportunities to take on so many initiatives. I think just the only way that I guess school committee could support is just, you know, keep telling us ways we can help improve the school and how we can, you know, get in there and find new projects. Yeah. Well, thank you. And whatever um, projects that you come up with, please keep in touch with us because sometimes they need resources. And one of the ways that you get access to those is through, you know, appealing to obviously you guys have done a good job looking for grants and other outside things. And, and for us, as we think about our budget going forward. So thank you. Yeah, I'll let you know. Thank you. Great. Thank you guys very much. And um, we'll, uh, uh, I'll see you at the next meeting. Can I just throw one last oh, thing sorry, in there, yeah. Yep. yeah, I I'm not I don't want to repeat everything that Maggie just said, but um, Sasha and Angela, thank you so much for reporting to us, and we would love to to hear back again um, at some point where you're doing. I think it's really exciting that you are going beyond the four schools and into the towns, and I think I'll speak for myself, but I think a lot of the parents out there. Uh, can use the education also. And I love that that you are doing that too. So great job. This is really exciting. Can I just add also, you know, it's it's just so encouraging to see students like yourselves taking on these important issues. I want to congratulate you on the progress that you made um, at Sherburne Town Meeting and to say that I look forward to um, Dover's town meeting and, and hearing more about the emergency declaration there. So thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate your support. All right, does anyone else have another question or a comment? I'm not seeing anyone. All right, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to the security update. Oh, please. no, okay, oh. sorry, this is a three-parter. So the oh, sorry, Don. <laughs> um, so uh, I would like to introduce Dorothea and Gino, and I don't know what order you two have decided, but I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, how about, uh, I was just planning to do a quick review of the Green Community Program uh, projects that have been done in Dover and Sherburne the last uh, eight or nine years, and then turn it over to Dorothea for the exciting grant application that we have upcoming for um, uh, a new uh, MVP grant, which is Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant. If I can just share my screen. So Do Sherburn became a green community in 2011 and the first uh, grant projects that were done uh, were to convert Sherburn town buildings, including Pine Hill School uh, to LED lighting. And the second grant also involved uh, Pine Hill School. In fact, it was totally for Pine Hill School to upgrade the library and gym air handlers, the unit ventilators in the classrooms and uh, soffit, uh, soffit and insulation um, at that building. In 2017, Dover became a town a green community as well. And again, the first project was essentially converting all the lighting to uh, LEDs. Uh, 2018, Sherburn upgraded the Sherburn police, the police station uh, heating system to high efficiency gas furnaces. In 2019, Dover uh, upgraded the protective services building to heat pumps, as well as doing air sealing and insulation for the library, townhouse, and uh, 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 one other building I can't remember, I think probably <laughs> protective services, and, in, and uh, converted all the street lights to LEDs. Um, in 2020, we got a technical assistance grant that uh, hired a consultant to study the feasibility of a geothermal system at Pine Hill. 
And then in 2021, uh, Sherbin also converted its street lights to LED as well as uh, it, it not done yet, but the project includes weatherization at Town Hall and the DPW garage. So that's, that's the essence of the, of the uh, green communities. I, I'll stop this, but um, also just to let you know, not part of green communities, but separate grant program, uh, Town Hall was able to get uh, an electric vehicle charging station so far installed is, uh, is a level two station. We also have gotten approval for a level three station, which will be in, in installed shortly. Um, just to let you know, there, there is, uh, I got an email two days ago about the um, electric vehicle grant program is opening again. And there's an opportunity if you're interested in uh, having a station at the school, mm. one of the schools or more, the, that's a possibility. So that's it. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dorothea uh, to talk about the upcoming MVP grant application. Uh, thanks. Oh, and um, um, hello again, everybody. We uh, I think we talked last year, right, right around the same time uh, about the students' projects. And um, just to clarify, Gino is a green community a grant application in Sherborne while I'm basically in charge for the community engagement to residents and to the school community. And in that capacity, I have been working the last two years with Pine Hill Elementary, with uh, the Sustainability Task Force, and with a couple of teachers at the middle school to bring all these programs forward you just heard about uh, from Angela. So I have a grant program going from the Harold Gra uh, Greenspoon Foundation, which uh, is situated in the Berkshires in Springfield and uh, gives me regular money to uh, seed money for programs that you come to Sherborne, but also come to the regional schools. Uh, for example, I sponsored, um, I'm sponsoring the tag program at the middle school, um, rain barrels, and I'm financing that with $100. And it makes a significant, how can I put it? It makes these projects that students identify make a difference in the schools. And uh, I'm happy to do this kind of work. So um, I wanted to talk about briefly about the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant. And it it's, sounds like a convoluted name, but it's nothing else than a, a state program that actually acknowledges that we already have progressed into, into um, reality of climate change, so to speak. We see... Um, you know, uh, weather events that are, you know, pretty intense, we see rainfalls, and we see the effects of that in our communities by, you know, washed out culverts, by um, algae blooms in the farm pond and all of that. So we are, Gene and I are jointly applying for a new round um, this time. And we are basically uh, proposing a plan to get um, a model how we can galvanize our entire community around climate action, like you know the school communities, but predominantly, of course, the residents in switching to electric cars and to, to clean heating and cooling. And that application is staged in a way that we first do this community inputs um, and plan and then in the phase number two and three, which is further out in the next couple of years, we will look at the school campus and what we can do to uh, bring the same technologies like electric school buses, um, solar and whatnot to the school. So that's a program that we are applying for. It's very competitive. Um, a lot of communities apply for these funds. It's in the order of a fifth. $60,000 and we're hoping for the support of the regional school board because that will make our application more competitive because it has a regional outlook, so to speak. And with that, I wanna close and maybe take a couple of questions from you. And I know we are in, you know, we don't have so much time so many things on the agenda tonight. 
And let me just add uh, for the, uh, Dorothy just mentioned uh, support from the Regional School Committee. She did draft a letter of support that we just received. Uh, I plan on putting that on the Regional School Committee meeting uh, coming up so that you have an opportunity. So tonight you sort of, she's laid the groundwork, but there is a letter that we'll put in your packet and see if you would are willing to um, add your signature to that support, which the timing is perfect um, because the uh, grant application is due a day or two after your meeting on Tuesday. So I just wanted to clarify that. Great, thanks, Don. Does anyone have any questions for Dorothea? Don't see any. I look forward to uh, to learning more about this, Dorothea. Thank you for your report and um, exciting news, especially all the work with the student groups. Yeah, definitely. I'm so I'm so smitten by these really engaged students. They make my work so much easier, and it's great to see them come forward. And uh, it's a great school system. That's sure. Thank you so much. Great, and I've enjoyed working with both uh, Dorothy and Gino. And uh, just so you know, a lot of our capital projects that have um, the possibility for energy savings, we, we try to coordinate um, through both towns uh, with Gino being one of the primary coordinators in opportunities that we can to um, uh, uh, apply for grants. We haven't, uh, haven't, had, haven't had, had our first one at the region yet, but we've got a couple of projects coming up and that's our hope is that we'll coordinate uh, with both of our member towns being green communities that we'll have that opportunity to, um, uh, to acquire some grant funding for that. So I appreciate their support on that. And we can uh, answer more questions about the um, MVP later, MVP letter, support letter um, at Tuesday's meeting. Um, I was just gonna round out this section by just um, refreshing your memory on some of the things that we're already doing here on at the school. Um, obviously energy, saving energy is something that we can do even beyond uh, replacing our um, fossil fuel, um, oil and gas at the region. So the energy management system, that's been a huge investment in, for the region this year. And is uh, we're actually having our, our um, closing meeting on that project next week. Um, that Those upgrades are gonna allow us to uh, definitely reduce the energy that we use. Um, it has uh, a very uh, sophisticated uh, systems in that the, um, the units will know to when to bring a room up to set temperature, but knowing that if, it, if our system is saying you're gonna go below for the night schedule, it'll actually pull back the energy being used, knowing that it can sustain that set point energy um, you know, for an hour or two without running the equipment. Um, you'll hear us talk about uh, installing variable frequency drives in our water system. So there are many things that we're doing on the energy side um, that if, if it's in this short junction that we'll be able to save energy. Waste is another um, big uh, area that we work here on all campuses. As you know, a lot of that uh, recycling and waste um, conservation sort of went out the door with COVID, uh, right? We sort of had to operate completely different, but you'll notice that the students are talking about working with Janelle Madden, um, at least at the region to reinstate our compost program. And we're going back to our recycling, um, definitely at the region. Uh, we are working on at the, in the food service uh, uh, kitchens to going back to the trays, the compostable trays that we used to use versus all the, the packaged uh, fat or fat, uh, uh, sorry, packaged um, uh, boxes and plastic that we've been using because of COVID. So we're slowly going back to those times. And so we're hopefully being able to get back. We were in such a good position before COVID. So it will take us a little time to re-educate our students. Uh, but uh, like I said, the, the food subcommittee has agreed to sort of um, spearhead going back into this um, arena with Janelle. So we're really looking forward to that. We will also keep you updated on um, other projects that we have. As you know, we have done a lot of LED lighting. We still need to do the high school. So that'll be on our, 
our ticket to do. And it's it's great to have um, a fully staffed facility now with Sean McGee joining us. So we look forward to getting past COVID and looking forward to ways that we can uh, participate in the um, you know the climate um, emergency preparedness uh, arena and really focus on some of those things versus COVID. So um, just want to give you a little insight into what sort of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis here. And if there's any questions, happy to answer, but we appreciate everyone's time tonight to sort of talk about these very important topics. Thanks so much, Don. That's really exciting news. I just have one question, more just clarification, Dorothea. <clears throat> Are the grants to study the efficacy of new projects or to support projects that are already identified or both? Um, are you referring, Dennis, to the MVP or to the Green Communities Grants? Mm, C, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> then um, uh, the Green Communities Grants, and I think Gino can jump in here, are coming on a regular basis for improving the buildings. The MVP grant is a state program that doesn't have to do with buildings per se, but rather with resilience issues like the effects of climate change, the precipitation, the winter storms, the, the heat waves. But that means for us, we need also to get our buildings in shape so that they can work as a, a more resilient. For example, what do we do during an outage? And uh, we need to embrace um, thoughts like, or projects like battery storage, solar, so that we have a building where we can bring our elderly to when we get a pronounced heat wave and we have an outage, things like that. So um, Gino, do you wanna jump in and explain? Yeah. Well, green communities, that, that's for actually implementing projects. And part of the application process is to, is to you have to have an analysis done of uh, what the project is, how much it costs, what the energy savings are, and so what the payback period would be. And that makes it mo more competitive. Um, so, yeah, it's not, it's, they, we did have that, what was called a technical assistance grant. That's not, tech, not really part of green communities, but that, that looked at uh, feasibility for geothermal, but green communities itself is primarily for actual projects. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Don. Then I don't wanna, oh, Colleen, I see your hand. Thank you. Um, I was just, I'm curious about where we are with solar. Um, you know, not, not whether we, you know, get the grant funding or not, I think it's something we should be exploring. And I'm curious about the life of our, you know, where, where we are with our roofs. And, um, you know, if that has been studied in terms of energy savings from solar panel installation sooner rather than later. Right. So we are we're on the five year replacement cycle right now with all of our buildings. So our uh, rooftops that are on first um, uh, first to be restored is here at the region. So we're taking on the middle school and Lankless Commons this summer. Um, it has been determined at the region that um, our rooftops, because of the amount of HVAC equipment that are on the roofs, that we will not be putting solar on the roofs here. Um, we're looking at potentially, because we have so much open land here with the parking lots and such, that if we do solar at the region campus, that's most likely will be the way we'll do it. Um, we have done our preliminary studies of the both Pine Hill and Chickory rooftops. So that will be our next project to follow that along, see what we're doing, and then see what our opportunities are for solar. So we're not far enough along in the process for the other um, schools at this point to give you a clear decision. But believe me, that is definitely one of the questions that always comes up with our town capital committees um, as well as school committees. So it's definitely at the forefront of our research as we continue on and see if we're a good candidate based on the type of roof we have and the location of where we are. Um, and so that will be fully explored uh, in the next probably two to three years with both Chickory and Pine Hill. Great, thank you. And is that jurisdiction of like the school committee or is that 
the school with the towns and Dorothea and Gino? Like, mm -hmm. it is because right there, um, we we work in we work in partnership, and obviously they're funding the capital projects, and they have goals that they're trying to achieve. And as us being one of the largest sort of occupants and and businesses that, to say in the in the two towns, um, it, it, it's totally a collaborative process um, with that. Thanks. More so at the towns than it is at the region, because the region is a little bit of a different animal. Obviously, we work with both towns, but there's a little more autonomy at the, the region, whereas both the towns, that's really their buildings, and we are working even closer, cl more closely with them, um, uh, with the two schools in that, in that uh, arena. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, Don, and everyone else who reported tonight. Exciting news in progress. Um, thank you. Thank look you. Forward, look forward thank to you, hearing everyone. more on May 3rd. Um, okay, and now I believe we are ready for the security update. Yes, yeah, so we're pleased tonight to have um, Jason Brennan sh uh, sh uh, joining us to share um, an update for the school committee about what we've been doing in the arena of security. For those of you who've been um, on school committee for a number of years, you'll recall that we have engaged uh, Synergy. I think back in 2018, um, they came and did um, sort of security audits on all of our campuses. Um, and we actually at the region did quite a bit of work because you remember you're an open campus. We installed the, the FOB system um, and um, a lot of other uh, security enhancements. In addition to that, they provided training back then for all four schools. Um, with, with the hybrid and the closure and, and COVID, um, there was a desire by our staff to sort of have a refresher. Um, and so we did re-engage with Synergy and um, the region has actually already had their uh, training on April 6th. And we have the uh, elementary schools having their training on their next um, early release day, which is uh, May 4th. Um, so Jason, I think he's here. We'll see if we can, he's working in his office. Jason? Oh, oh I'm here. There you are, perfect. No panic, no technical difficulty. No <laughs> That was, that was a good lead up. Hopefully I didn't miss out on it. Nope, nope, perfect. I was just uh, refreshing um, the school committee's um, history on uh, that we worked with you back in 2018 on some significant work and that you've rejoined us recently to do some uh, refresher training. Yes. And um, that you're here to sort of share the philosophy of um, uh, what your firm does for staffing as far as security training and uh, a little bit about the training sessions. Awesome. Look forward to it. So I will share my screen because he has a PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, next slide, Donna. Do, can I forward? Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I'll all right, great. All right, thank you all very much. I, I know you have a lot, uh, a lot of other things going on, so I'll try to keep it as concise as I can. Uh, I'll give you an update as to uh, what we're doing, some of our philosophies, and then I'll open it up to any questions that uh, that might arise um, once we're done talking or during the presentation. If you have something specific, feel free to uh, just jump in or uh, raise hand or or uh, H side chat. So we've been uh, working with the school. As Don had mentioned, we have been here before. We were back in 2018. We did this. And Don, I, I also believe we did the uh, the in-person training like we're doing now. Yes, you uh, did. Yep. So the staff has been somewhat exposed to this already. Uh, but we teach a program that models a lot of the other programs that are out uh, nationwide. Our program is called uh, Locate, Lockdown, Leave, Live, the four L's. Um, it's in a, what we consider to be a, uh, a more efficient and direct program as far as what we're looking to try to get accomplished with your staff. We realize we don't have a lot of time with them uh, and that they're not going to really receive a lot of training in it. So we, we tailored the actual names of the different things that we're doing uh, to be exactly what it is that we want them to do. Uh, understanding things like the human stress response and how the human machine operates under that kind of stress 
uh, we realized very early on that we needed to be very clear in the message that we want them to do and give them uh, a very easy path to get there so that they don't have, uh, they, they have much less in the area of recollection as opposed to just response. Um, again, knowing that under that kind of stress, uh, their abilities, their cognitive capabilities are going to be seriously, uh, seriously diminished uh, so that giving them some of these direct tools, uh, and that's really what we call them. These are their tools, not necessarily do this uh, or you know, do any one particular um, item on this list. It's more of this. These are your tools. You choose which one you use at any given time. Uh, next slide. This slide we offer, we use this, and most of these slides you're going to see here are, are also part of the presentation. And we, we, we preface this by saying the, the people that we bring in to teach your folks are extremely experienced uh, first responders, folks who have a lot of experience, in my opinion, and it's always been this way. We've been teaching for a uh, better part of uh, close to 20 years now. Um, it's important that the people that are teaching your folks understand what this actual event looks like and feels like in real time, because we don't have, we don't have enough time nor the ability to actually put them in that kind of a stressful, fearful moment. So often we have to say to them, just trust the people that are teaching you that they didn't just learn this in a book or see this in a PowerPoint presentation or take a college class on it. You know, these guys are experienced first responders who have uh, been, on, been on the job for 25 plus years. We're at the Boston Marathon bombings. We're part of the Watertown manhunt, responded to hundreds of critical incidents. And, and I often joke, it's, you know, we call this our ego slide. You know, hey, look how awesome we are. But I then flip it around and say, it's not really designed to say, look how great we are. It's more to tell them I've been afraid. I've felt that fear that you will fear in that moment. And we understand the uh, the diminished return that we get sometimes or the difficulty that we have making decisions. So we try to help them. Let's just focus on what we know you're going to be able to do, not what you can't do uh, and, and try to empower them and say, you can be successful in these moments because we have, and we've been able to work through those type of difficult moments, but I can't get you there today. It took us 25 years to learn this, but if you have faith in the guy that's with you, when he says, just don't, you know, don't bother with that or don't try doing that because under this kind of stress, you're probably not going to be able to, uh, nor is that probably practical in that type of a moment. And that's this is just a have faith slide, so to speak. Just trust the people that you're with. They do know what they are talking about. And they're not just here to uh, just here because they're here because they're very passionate and they really do care about the program. Next slide, Don. Uh, the purpose of the program itself, when we talk to them and what we try to get across to them, First and foremost, a retainable, repeatable, and realistic. And for us, that's one of the most important parts of the program. We will repeat regularly through the presentation, lockdown, leave, live, lockdown, leave, live. You're, the answer to every question anybody ever asks me about an, what to do during an active shooter incident is always going to be the same. Once you've located and identified that you are in that type of a situation, you have three tools to use, lockdown, leave, live, lockdown, leave, live, lockdown, leave, live. And that repetition we know is effective uh, because in other areas of life safety, uh, it works very effectively and it's, it's almost created uh, almost like a zombie-like approach or a very muscle memory approach to things like fire drills. People don't have any question when the fire alarm begins to go off in a building, most even even children at a moderate level don't have any question as to what it is and what they're supposed to be doing. And that is due to repetition. So by repeating and using um, a, a set of tools or a set of options that they can repeat under stress, we find that they're going to be a lot more successful. So lockdown, leave, live, lockdown, leave, live. And we just continually harp on that with them. And we ask them regularly, okay, what are your three options during the an active shooter incident? And we, we try to get them to repeat it in the hope that when the fire alarm goes off, everybody in this in this meeting knows you stand up, file orderly to the closest exit, don't don't run, don't push, walk outside, rally up outside and wait for the fire department to get there. We need the same type of response during a, a violent intruder or, uh, or, or a serious situation that you might find yourself in uh, where your life is in jeopardy. Uh, we talk a little bit with them about who the first responders are. And, and one, one of the first things we say to them is, you know, you have a very good police response coming. But for the first three to five minutes, which national average is five to eight minutes across the country, 
for the first three to five minutes, your staff, the people that are in these buildings are the first responders, the decisions that they make during the first three to five minutes of this event, knowing that most active shooter incidents are over in less than, in, in most cases, uh, eight to 10 minutes, these incidents are over, that the better part of this incident is happening with the teachers and with the students, not necessarily with the police. Once the police arrive, the incident is over very quickly. So we try to get it in their mind that that picture, picture the day as opposed to picture, and this is going to be an hour long event, two hour long. This event is five minutes. You need to do whatever it is that you're going to do for about five minutes until the first responders get there. And then this is going to be over. Uh, the first responders have been trained to respond to active shooter incidents. They have a training package and protocols that require them as soon as they arrive to enter the building, uh, find the shooter and stop the violence. That's not going to take very long, even a very big building. So if we can get it in their mind, focus on that window, that five minute window, as opposed to the five hour window, which is sometimes overwhelming for them. How am I going to deal with my kids? How am I going to, a lot of those are very big picture. Uh, and for a lot of, and, and for most of this incident, it really is focusing on, focus on the five minutes uh, that we need you to, the, the violence until the shooter, until the uh, first responders arrive. Stress inoculation. The, the day itself tends to draw a little bit of stress. People get a little bit uncomfortable with it. Um, they don't necessarily uh, like the terminology. They don't like to hear they're going to do active shooter training. So that's enough in a lot of cases uh, to get people stressed. And we often refer back again to fire drills. Uh, you know, there is the stress inoculation uh, theory is if you expose somebody enough times to stress, st stressful circumstances, they become either immune or, or very efficient in those. And that in my industry, that's exactly what happens. That's why we train and that's why we do stressful training. Uh, firefighters are the same way. Fire drill is a perfect example of that. There is no fear when a fire, when a fire alarm goes off in a building, in most cases, there is very little fear involved in it. Most people are annoyed by a fire alarm more than they are afraid of it. Yet what it's saying is, just as dangerous and just as fearful as an active shooter and so the building's on fire and you need to get out of here or else your life is in jeopardy. But because we have exposed people to this for so long, they are not, they've been inoculated to it. There is no fear. They know exactly what to do. The human stress response doesn't kick in because the machine has an answer. It knows exactly what to do. Stand up, file, outside, rally, wait for the fire department. So it doesn't induce that human stress response or that panic state. So we, are, we, we find that people are very cognitive during that. They can figure out where the closest exit is. They cannot push. They don't run. They don't panic. The same thing needs to happen with active shooters. So we don't love the um, fear-based programs. There's a lot of programs out there that push the other side uh, of active shooter, the, the, the danger and the, and, the, and the failures, and you're going to be trapped in a room. And we focus on the other side. We find that, uh, and knowing clinically that once you get a person to a state of fear or panic, they don't cognitively have the capability to process new information like that. So we actually try to go to the other side and keep them calm, keep it lighthearted, as lighthearted as we can, ask questions, engage with them, try to talk with them, and just try to teach them that even no matter how bad things are, you still have to do something. You can't, we can't just allow this situation to get ahead of us. So uh, using stress as opposed to fear, uh, we work very, very hard to try to keep the atmosphere comfortable for people because we want them to learn. I don't want them to be scared of what we're teaching. I want them to maybe be stressed. I want them to, to, to understand the levity of it, but I don't want them to be afraid of it. So we work, uh, we work with them pretty, even in the short window that we have, uh, there's enough stress to get them to where we need them to be, especially when we have them start actually barricading doors and tying things off and putting them to task a little bit. That's enough stress. So the other part we focus on, and it's a big part of our program, and, and, and I truly believe in it, is I need to empower your staff. I need to empower the teachers. I need to empower the people that are being taught this program to make decisions independently of you, me, the superintendents, the principals, the their bosses, the police, the fire, because in most cases, statistically, the decisions that they're going to make are going to be individual decisions. So they need to be, teachers are classically not very good at this. Uh, nurses are not very good at this. Uh, folks that, that work in environments that involve policies, procedures, and lesson plans tend to like to be told what to do. This is the lesson plan for the day. This We're going to do step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. What we find the challenge with that is, is in a violent intruder, 
uh, in, in dangerous situations like this, sometimes the lesson plan goes from step one to step 10 in one jump. And if the person can't or isn't comfortable being told to, listen, here are your tools. I'm not going to tell you when or how to use them. You pick which one works at step one. And then when it jumps to step 10, you might have to pick a different tool. So that empowerment to make those decisions sometimes makes them a little more comfortable too, because I can say to them, look, in this situation, this is your call. If you know that your life or others' life is in jeopardy and you need to make that decision to barricade or do whatever it is, then you need to make that decision. You can't wait for somebody to come on the PA to tell you that if you know that this is actually a problem. So uh, the empowerment piece is a big part of the day. Tell them they can do it. And not only telling them they can do it, but letting them actually do it. it. It's one thing to sit there and tell somebody, if you have some, if there's a person trying to harm you and you need to barricade yourself in a room, lock the door, do this, do this. It's a completely different animal when you say, okay, go do it. And then watch them actually barricade a door and give them tips as to, this is how you use an extension cord to tie the door handle to that piece of furniture. So the door is a little bit more rigid so that, yeah, maybe he could get through it, but is he going to take the time to get through it? So that empowerment piece is, I could definitely do this. I'm a teacher. I'm by myself, but you know what? I just did it and I can do that. I could definitely do this myself. And it makes them kind of go back and think, how would I go about doing that? Next slide, Don. This is a big one. Um, <clears throat> we use this all the time. Uh, it's a real, it's a real important piece of the educational component for us. I, I often say to people, forget about the play, process first place. Forget about the place. And I, 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 I'll say to all of you, think about the place that you work in, your office. For the teachers, I say to them, think about your classroom. Think about the office space, the library, the cafeteria, wherever it is that you are every day. And don't think of it, think of it again for the rest of the training, because that's a trap. What I want you to think about is the process. Lockdown, leave, live. How do I lock and barricade a door? Period. How do I leave? And how do I fight back or defend myself? Live if I ever had to. The trap is is if you only focus on the space that you're in, you're very often going to find yourself. And statistically, again, we find people, they, they end up in these situations outside of their classroom, outside of their office, and they don't have an answer because the machine hasn't developed that path. So rather than saying, learn how to do this in your classroom, yes, we're going to teach you how to do it. And in many cases, we're going to teach you how to do it in your classroom. But remember, uh, next slide, Don. When we talk about it, this is what we want people to think about. This is a this is a life safety program. This is not a school based program. I don't. You could be in. You could be right here in your home. You could be anywhere, at Boston Marathon, Aurora, Colorado, Orlando nightclubs, Bertucci's in Taunton, South Shore Plaza in Braintree. Recently, we've been twice to that. Recently, um, you could be anywhere. Uh, it, it's not the place. It's the process. Do you know what to do when you're at Logan Airport with your family? And over the PA, active shooter in the building, active shooter in the building, went to a bus station, the train station, lockdown, leave, live. That's the answer, not the place. The place just happens. Wherever you are, that's what you have to figure out. If you can lock yourself and barricade yourself in a space, do it. If you have to leave, this is how. And if you can't do either of those and you have to protect yourself, these are some of the things that you can consider. So we have process, process, process. Forget about the place. Just think about the tool. My office doesn't lock. My it has glass. It has. They, they give us a million different what ifs, but the answer is always the same. If it doesn't lock, then you can, then leave. If you can't leave, then prepare to do this. So, we'll use the tool as the answer, but we often say to them, process. Don't worry about the place. It's that's too easy. Uh, next slide, Tom. And then these are the actual components, and we talk about them uh, in detail, presentation wise, and then we actually break them out into their groups. We break up the day uh, into two parts. The first part is a presentation similar to what we're doing here, where we just talk about the empowerment and all those things that I talked to to try to make them comfortable and feel confident. Then I talk a little bit about each of the components. What does locate, uh, what does locate mean? How do you locate and identify an active shooter? You're gonna hear it, you're gonna see it, there's gonna be a PA announcement, you're gonna hear gunshots. In a lot of different ways that you're gonna become aware of it, but when you are aware of it, what do you do? And we, we say to them, if you become aware of it and you're around other people, warn, inform, and assist. Warn others what to do because you're going to find yourself around kids who don't know what to do. You're at the movie theater. The people don't know what to do. You're on the bus. They don't know what to do. You're going to be surrounded constantly by people who don't want to do. Tell them, hey, everybody, come with me. Get in this room. Let's lock and barricade this space. Hey, everybody, run. So we have to. we sometimes have to say, this is what you need to do. And then most importantly, call the police. Warn, inform, and assist. Warn who? Others around you. Inform who? The police. Because 
it's a three, it's a, it's a five to eight minute event from the time that the police get notified. But if we spend a lot of time doing other things, which is often what happens, uh, we lose a lot of valuable response time. So we start very early in the program saying, contact 911, contact 911 and do this, leave the line open. Even if you can't talk, just dial 911 and leave it open. And just sometimes your conversation or the emergency happening behind you is enough to prompt a response to where you are. We can find you through location on your phone. Uh, most 911 calls, especially in this day and age, come at least very closely to the location. So it's just a helpful block to start talking a little bit about what to do. Lockdown, we tell them all the different important pieces of a lockdown, why we do them, how we do them. We, we're going to show you how to do them. When you do a lockdown, we use a term called the ABCs of a lockdown. And it's important that we do it in that uh, particular way. The ABCs of a lockdown are simply A, always shut and lock the room, the door of the room that you're in. B, barricade. C, call 911. D, duck and defend. The ABCs of a lockdown. And then we talk about it and then we actually go do it. So we have them in the rooms and we say, okay, we're going to use the ABCs of the lockdown. Shut and lock the door. Now let's talk about a barricade. What is a barricade? A barricade is a physical deterrent to the room, but it is also a psychological deterrent to the room because we know 99% of the time, less than 1% of the time, bad guy has breached into a room to get the people in there. Why? Well, because uh, simply a locked door is enough to move a person along. And we talk about why is it only 1% of the time? They got five minutes. Are they going to spend five minutes chasing other people around or are they going to spend five minutes trying to break a door down? What we found in the past is they're not spending a lot of time trying to get into spaces. So let's make those spaces very challenging, both physically because they can't get through the door or psychologically, because when they start to push the door, now the barricade becomes a problem and chairs are falling and it's it tied and it just becomes a nuisance to the point where the person psychologically says, I could do this, but is it really worth the time that I'm wasting? And we get them to move on. Leave. We spend a lot of time talking about how to leave. It's a big buzzy area. Uh, it's also a huge instinctive area. Uh, most of us uh, suffer from, or not really suffer, but it is, it's a very prehistoric response. Uh, the fight or flight instinct, flight being run. Uh, and during an incident like this, that running or that flight is uh, very challenging for teachers, especially. Where are you going? How are you going? And who are you taking with you? Can be very challenging when we talk about leave. So we talk to them about it. How do you leave? How do you leave by yourself? Unpredictable behavior, be zigzag, uh, up and down behind vehicles. I call it mousy. Be mousy. You know, if you ever let put a mouse down on the ground and the door was straight across and you let him go, he'd never run straight out the door. He's prey. He's been biologically designed to, to survive. So he would run under the refrigerator, behind the microwave, over the, this, down below the table, between your legs and out the door in the hope that that distraction beha distractive behavior, the predator can't find them. We can be mousy too. We can run out the door to the vehicles, duck down to the dumpster, duck down to the edge of the building, duck down to the woods and we're gone. So we talk a little bit about how to leave individually and then some of the ideas on how to leave with a group because now you have to leave with 30 kids with you? Uh, or what do you do with 30 kids? How do you get them to leave? Uh, so we spend a bit of time on that. And then finally, the live piece. Uh, we, we work very hard to tell them this is not a fight. Uh, we don't want people fighting. We don't want any offensive or aggressive behavior unless it's a last resort and you have no alternative. Uh, we don't want people going looking for the problem. Uh, statistically, that has not turned out very well for the people who went looking uh, for a shooter and found that person, that's generally ended badly. So we give them some options. We tell them what to do and how to do it. Now, the barricade is part of it. You know, that's the time to take action if he's trying to come into your space, uh, throwing objects, distractions, uh, working together with other people, uh, arming yourself with makeshift, uh, makeshift items. So we spend some time on that uh, and talk a little bit and answer questions related to that as well. Next slide, now. So that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, that's, that's a three hour day right there crammed into about 15 minutes. It was kind of like a shotgun blast of information. I apologize. Uh, but I wanted to just give you some, an idea of the direction that we're going uh, uh, with your, um, with your teachers and, uh, and eventually other staff and anybody else that's in the building. And so far the feedback has been um, been well, and we've we've had a, a really good track record in the past with uh, both teaching this, and unfortunately, a few times uh, folks having to actually use these uh, techniques to protect themselves in events. 
Any questions? That's always the awkward part of Zoom. When you stop, nobody knows that you're done. Thank you so much. I think I see, um, Tracy, is that you, Austin Graham? Yes, yes, that's me. Sorry, I can't change the name. Um, Jason, I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, as a mother and a nurse and a member of the school committee, I think that was probably one of the most comprehensive explanations of emergency situations that I've ever heard. Uh, thank you for um, coming and, you know, making us feel better about um, your trainings for our, our community. Um, do you come yearly? That, I guess that's my first question. Do you come yearly to speak? Because I'd love to keep hearing um, your company come and speak and, and assure us about what you're doing. Well, uh, we do a lot of different versions. I, uh, some of the stuff I, I'll sidestep a little bit because I'm a, I'm a company. So if you say, do you come yearly? I'm going to say, of course I do come yearly. But, Great. Um, yeah. I, we would do we would do whatever the school is comfortable with. We uh, offer a lot of different. Pro We'd love to. Uh, our opinion. I'm also a, uh, you know, on two sides of it. I'm also a first responder, so I, I I'm, yep. and, a, and a local first responder. So I would be coming to Dover. Uh, we right. we've taken the approach, uh, and we I also know I sit on a few statewide committees. Just before COVID set in, uh, the governor's office was very close to signing a bill that was going to mirror the fire drill or fire process uh, for schools related to active shooter, which would mean that they would have to uh, do four or five, four violent intruder drills a year, not necessarily to the level we're talking, but uh, that is definitely something that was on the agenda. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the future it is again, it's what right. our, our feeling with this is, is it is a perishable skill uh, that it, we aren't at fire drill just yet with people. So if they don't hear it more regularly, we fear that they're going to lose the, you know, they're going to lose the edge a little bit. So yearly right. is a good start. Right. No, I totally agree. And um, do you do um, community um, education? Um, you know, if we had you come into the community and speak to the parents some night, um, Love it. do you do that? Okay. It's a huge, it's a huge help. Uh, we do also, we do town-based programs. So we do town halls. Uh, we've done a, a, a bunch of town halls, town officials, Schools, we've spoke at uh, uh, schools at, at uh, town hall style meetings for parents to it's a, the, one of the biggest hurdles we find with violent intruder is uh, lack of information or misinformation on the one of the most important areas is the parents, because yes. if they don't have faith and they don't understand what you're doing, sometimes they can be kind of subversive or counterproductive where they're going to either Right. During the incident, they're going to come to your school and cause problems because now I have to get them. I have to get them away from the school. Secondarily, they cause problems because they aren't on the same script that you are, and sometimes they are feeding information, misinformation in some cases, to even their children, saying, "You know, I don't care what the teacher says. Jump out the window and run." And it, I want to pull my hair on and say, "No, the teacher knows exactly what she's doing. She's going to lock and barricade that room until it's mm -hmm. time to run." So let the teacher, so I, I, we did talk about this at one of our meetings um, with the superintendent and the others as far as telling, the t telling parents and, and telling people, hey, listen, we actively practice this regularly and please don't come to the school. There'll be a staging area established for you. The teachers have been properly trained. The first responders have been involved with this trust in the school. They know what they're doing so that they're not, they're not kind of sabotaging your teacher's program because the teacher's now fighting with kids to get them to do what exactly. they need to do. Right. I agree. And that's, I guess, to the chair, since um, I, you know, I won't be here. This is my um, last year on the school committee, but um, just to the chairs, if we could keep having synergy come back, I think it would be great. And I agree with completely with what you're saying. I've been in emergency situations where um, there are so many people around, you can't get done. What is the most important? So I think if parents know um, that you're there and what to do and, and, you know, you keep coming and talking to us and telling us what you're doing. I think parents will feel a lot better. So thank you again. It was great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, I see your hand. Yes. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think this is a, a really good presentation and I would agree with you on, on preparing the teachers as best that we can. Um, does your program go further into the training from teachers to students and sort of where, where do you see the effectiveness um, go away? So my, the context for that is I get a little bit worried with, as you mentioned, sort of introducing these really stressful situations and for students perspective for most ages, 
it's it'd be it's challenging enough for an adult to uh to process this um just sort of wondering i don't love the state bill where students would be uh, engaged in this four or five times a year. But I do think that more teacher training is helpful and students to be able to listen to the teachers when, when instructed. But I love love your, your sort of opinion and take on that. It's a great question, Jeff. We get it all the time uh, and it's a huge challenge and I totally get it. I'm a parent. I have, I have four kids as well. And I, 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 it, I shudder sometimes to think of what that's going to look like. But uh, our feeling generally is when they're age appropriate, uh, and most schools can, you know, most teachers know what that level is. And we have we have three different tiers of this program uh, that we deal with for kids you know, uh, pre-K through third grade, fourth grade, through sixth grade, seventh grade, through ninth grade, and then everything up above that. But for different, if we were going to, for instance, train the students, which we have done, we've done the schools where they've involved the kids in the actual uh, program taught it uh, taught it at age appropriate levels. Obviously, the pre K is mostly driven to the teachers. As we get a little bit further up, it's a little bit cartoony, but it's still very you know trust the teacher, and so we educate them that way. The other and I I know sometimes that's unrealistic. So the other side of the fence is the uh, referring back to like let's say the four uh, drills. We don't have to actively go full blast every single time. What we call it is crawl walk run. Uh, you you crawl first, so you do an active lockdown drill where you just announce it, and the teacher locks the door and says, "Okay, we're just conducting a lockdown drill. This is what we would be doing." And it gives them a, just a light educational thumbnail, even if you give them a script as to what to say. Answer any questions. Five minutes. Unlock the door. Move on. Walk. That's the next time. Shut the door. Lock the door. And you space this out however you want. Shut the door. Lock the door. And the teacher then says, depending on the age group. All right. Now I would be at this point, I would be barricading the door and I would be using furniture in the room. You two over there, just push a couple of desks this way and something just as innocuous as moving two desks or two chairs over to the door and then explaining why becomes critically important because uh, we often equate it to like a fire drill. If we never set the fire alarms off, people's response the first time they heard it would be dramatically different than what it is today, simply for the fact that they've never heard it before. So for the, you can say it a hundred times, I'm going to move desks, I'm going to move desks. But psychologically, if this third grader has never seen that before, and then we have a lockdown drill and we've done it first grade, second grade, third grade, and then the third grade, it's real. And the teacher doesn't get up and lock the door. What does the teacher do when it's real? Teacher gets up, locks the door, and then begins piling stuff up against the door. Psychologically, that's a that's a huge overload for that person, as opposed to saying ahead of time, that's not unusual for me because the teacher not only told me that, but I remember during the drills, she actually moved those desks over there before. So we can start building that pathway early with something as simple as move two chairs and say that you, that's the lockdown drill and say, it would be way more than two chairs. And a matter of fact, hey, watch this, it'd be pretty funny. I'm going to take an extension cord and tie it around the door and tie it to this chair, because if it ever happened, that's what I would do. And you know what I'm going to you know what else would be pretty fun. We're going to take every single thing in this room and we're going to throw it up against this door. So to just kind of take the uh, psychological stress of the moment off uh, during that crisis. So that's the walk phase. And then run is obviously what we're doing with your teachers now. Like you actually have them barricade the door for real. So Sometimes we get a little, we go a little fast with this. You know, we go from, uh, okay, we have it. Let's do a drill tomorrow. And it goes too far and it kind of freaks everybody out. So by doing it in some phases, we can kind of educate the children without actually scaring them, you know, pieces, a little bit at a time, just give them a little bite at a time and we'll get there. And then eventually by the time they get to high school, it's part of the day. And I will be, I mean, professionally, I will be honest with you. I think the harder people to teach are the adults than the kids. I think kids are well aware of what's going on in the world. <clears throat> I think they're socially in a completely different place. I think they see violence in a different way than we do because of the way we were brought up, maybe. Uh, so I, I, we have never had a child uh, push back on us when we've run these drills. We've had adults push back on us when we run these drills. Adults who are responsible to do the things we're talking about are pushing back. And, and we often say, look, you're you're going to actually have to do this for real in a really, really ugly situation. I'm not sure why you're pushing back. Students, kids, uh, once they become age appropriate and psychologically proper, you know, it's in a, it's in a good place for them. 
they are actually uh, pretty understanding of what's going on in the world. So I, 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 it can be done. It just needs to be done in a, uh, in a, in a way. Thank you. Colleen. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm curious if the teachers are being trained in psychological first aid, um, for the students who may become quite anxious, um, either during the drills or, um, if it, God forbid ever really happened. Um, I know that that can be critical as well and handling, um, the students and also maybe other staff members, but, um, I'm curious if your program includes psychological first aid. We don't because of the amount of time we have Colleen, I'm sorry. Uh, and, but I, I agree with you 100%. I think it's something that we need to, which is why we try to keep it fairly light when we do it with the teachers so that we're not trying to induce a lot of unnecessary, uh, we give them the post-traumatic stress. If you've ever been involved in an incident like this before and you think it's going to be a problem, don't participate. We'll keep you in a safe space. So, so we, we do that piece of it. We have worked with uh, some clinical psychologists and some other folks in the area of uh, early childhood development and uh, educational. It's a lot of our uh, uh, children's material, like our children's presentation was vetted uh, both through a clinic, uh, clinical psychologist and a uh, early childhood development curriculum creator. I, the particular title escapes me, but people who develop programs for children specifically for that reason. But with the small window we have, uh, two and a half hours is just too much. So yes, it's, it's definitely something you, you should probably follow up on uh, and definitely something you should be prepared for. You should have an emergency response team. You should have a uh, somebody on staff or at least know how to get some critical incident uh, debriefing staff on board if something bad was to ever happen. Uh, we do, uh, I will say this, we do have policies and procedures, uh, post-incident procedures, paperwork that we, uh, we offer schools to help out with how to write a policy, how to develop an emergency management plan, how to develop things like that, Colleen. But during the training itself, it's just, it is we just don't have that kind of time, but certainly a great block to do maybe after the training blocks are done. Thank you. Sarah? Thanks, Kate. Um, I just have to say out loud how sobering and devastating it is to even have this discussion in this context. But I also want to express my gratitude to Synergy and to Jason um, for walking us through this, walking our staff um, through what to do, because hopefully information is power in this um, situation. Um, but it really is a difficult conversation to have. And I am grateful to our administration and to our teachers for um, preparing, uh, preparing our, our schools for something that hopefully never comes to pass. So thank you. Yeah, I second that, Sarah, definitely. Any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you so much, Jason, for that update um, and that thorough description of the training and what's going on in our schools, I really appreciate it. Great, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate your time. Yes, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. All right, that brings us to our equity audit update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do wanna say, and I, I think Jason is leaving us, but um, you know, I have been around a long time, have worked on this in uh, other districts. Uh, I also, I uh, was very impressed with the training that we did in the region. Uh, I actually took part in a classroom um, with a group of teachers, um, excellent dialogue where looking at the inventory of our um, safety bags, so to say, um, or buckets as I call them. Um, and we uh, are working on all those things. But as I leave you, one of the things I wanna say was, you heard Jason talk about you know, um, what we're required to do with fire drills each year. You know, we, we have to look at that going into next year with what we would call, you know, best practices. And if it's four times a year going through these drills, even if it's something that the state hasn't done, it's something that we should be doing, you know, from the beginning of the year, you know, throughout the year. 
And Colleen, you bring up a very good point when you talk about, um, and what came to mind was crisis management teams. So certainly after the fact, I just want to say the district has had quite a bit of training. Um, we've had a couple of things happen uh, this past year where right away the principals are bringing their teams together, you know, depending on the situation and what we have to provide, you know, to our students and families. I think one of the biggest takeaways for me um, is coming up with, and maybe this is something we do next year when we start the process, and I'm talking next school year, is to make sure we have an evening for families, you know, to hear, um, I, I know this is recorded, uh, we can certainly talk about it at our individual school committee meetings, but to make sure, and hopefully we can be in person, and you can see the trainings, you can go into a classroom, you know, and see the things that we actually saw with our teachers and the trainings that'll go on uh, with our little students. And I also want to say in talking to the principals, uh, age appropriate, uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Reinemann, uh, when they talk to the students, I always get a kick out of, you know, they use things like, well, what if a skunk was to come in the school? You know, and, and little kids can think like that, you know, okay, something invaded our school and, and now we have to figure out, you know, how to be safe. So obviously, I'm, we're taking this very seriously. I don't want to make light of it. But your uh, teams certainly have done a great job working with their uh, teachers, uh, their students. It's certainly time to bring families on board. Um, so again, thank you to Jason. Uh, thank you to Dawn for working with our facilities uh, and again, making that a focus. And it, it's so sad to say that it feels good to be talking about some of the things that aren't just COVID related that we're able to you know, really put back uh, on the so-called front burner. Speaking of that, we have done a great job. And, you know, for me, it's almost been a year since I've been here. And when I was first introduced to the committee, um, it was the first uh, evening that we had a presentation on uh, the equity audit, uh, getting introduced to NYU. Sarah uh, McAllister is here again this evening and has continued to be here to update us uh, throughout the process. So, Sarah, let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you, uh, school committees. Um, thanks for having me again. Um, I can be very brief tonight and hopefully uh, not quite as heavy as the previous topic. Um, so tonight I'm just gonna provide a brief update on our data collection analysis progress since I last spoke to you in January. Um, so between January and now, we've completed a focus group with students with disabilities in high school, um, interviews with six parents who have removed one or more of their children from the Dover Sherburne schools for a range of reasons and circumstances, a focus group with the middle school and high school headmasters and assistant headmasters. And over the next few weeks, we'll be holding a similar focus group with the Pine Hill and Chickering principals and assistant principals, one with guidance staff, um, one with um, special education liaisons, EAs and other staff who spend time across multiple classrooms, um, and a focus group with LGBTQIA students, um, as well as an interview with um, Ms. Marshall Beals. Um, we have wrapped up analysis of the survey data that we collected this fall from students, parents, caregivers, and school staff. Um, you might recall we had a very high response rate, um, and the survey sample really closely paralleled the district demographics, which was great. Um, I'll just share a couple of notes. So in the survey, 75% of elementary school students, 82% of middle school students, and 80% of high school students reported that they have a place where they belong within the DS public schools. 68% um, of elementary, 58% of middle, and 58% of high school students report that all students have an equal voice in their school. Um, and 86% of parents and caregivers reported that their family is respected, encouraged, and welcomed in the schools. Um, at the same time, just 42% of high school students, 53% of parents and caregivers, and 37% of teachers and school staff believe that DS schools are preparing students to live in a diverse multicultural world. Um, I'll share two general trends that we noticed in the survey. Um, so across most items, um, white respondents and male respondents tended to be more positive in their assessments than other groups. That wasn't always the case and it varied across item, um, sort of which subgroups had different responses, but that was the overall pattern. Um, and second, um, teachers and school staff um, were substantially more critical of their own capacity than students or parents were of teacher capacity, um, which was somewhat of a surprise and I think bodes quite well for change efforts. Um, you know, I think it shows that teachers are reflective about their strengths and weaknesses, open to trying new ways of doing things and really open to professional development and support. And that was also very evident in the focus groups that we did with teachers and as, as also the open-ended responses to the survey. 
Um, so we've also made our way through the open-ended responses. Um, there was quite a lot of uh, really rich narrative data there. Um, we've, pull, we've pulled out a lot of themes, which are pretty much parallel to what we heard in the focus groups, but a little bit broader in some more examples. Um, my colleague, Dr. Lisette D'Souza, is currently analyzing conduct and transcript data with an eye to identifying any patterns of inequity and understanding when and where they emerge. Um, we're especially interested in access to honors and AP classes, um, patterns in disciplinary and special education referral, um, which are challenges nationally, um, but also were specifically identified as concerns in focus groups on the survey. Um, we're also looking at a few policy documents, including the discipline policy and the handbook, um, the course placement policy in light of other data and literature on best practices so that we can make some policy recommendations as well. <clears throat> um, since I last spoke with you, we've held one meeting with our full advisory board where we reviewed the survey data and themes and focus groups, and then an additional meeting with a small subset of advisory board members to help us think through additional qualitative data collection. Um, and the advisory board members have been, as always, incredibly insightful and generous with their time and knowledge. Um, and so we'll have a chance to meet with the full advisory board one more time in May before we make our initial report um, to all of you in June. So our plan is to share our initial findings and recommendations um, with the Joint School Committee and in a short public research brief in June, and then to share a more complete analysis and final recommendations in August of this year. Um, before I close and answer any questions, I just wanna share on behalf of our team that we really appreciate the level of transparency and reflection and honesty um, with which you know, students, parents, school staff, and district leaders have approached this audit. Um, we've, we feel like we've been able to develop a really rich and nuanced understanding of the district and the community that wouldn't have been possible without the same level of investment and welcome and just um, you know, taking this audit quite seriously. Um, I will stop there and I can answer any questions. Okay, uh, Tracy, I see your hand. Yes, um, thank you so much again for um, that explanation. We're, I know we're all looking forward to the, um, the results. You mentioned uh, the discipline policy. Does that include the bullying policy? Um, yes, we will also take a look at the discipline policy. I know that the discipline policy is more bound by um, state policy and legal requirements. And, you know, there's a limit okay. to whether it can be changed there, but we will take a look at that as well. Okay, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have a question for Sarah? I'm not seeing any. Well, thank you for that update, Sarah. I, we're all looking forward to hearing from you again in June. Great, um, thank you so much. Working together, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, school start time update. So thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, um, this evening, I was uh, very hopeful our superintendent-elect, uh, Beth McCoy, was going to be heading this up. And the reason I say that is I am going to pinch hit this evening. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that has been going on in the district for quite a number of years. Uh, I know um, with COVID uh, upon us in 2020, um, you continued to move forward uh, with your um, school start time changes. Um, and I know you've been looking forward to gathering uh, data. So I'm going to ask uh, Don Fattori and Kate McCarthy, my team, I'm going to start out. I know they're going to jump in uh, as we go through some of this information. So Donna, do you want to share the uh, PowerPoint? Kate I guess there. Kate is. Okay, Kate. Okay, next slide, please, our first slide. Sorry, I'm just trying to play it. Okay, here we go. Thank you. So uh, again, I'm gonna start with the decision that was actually made in April of 2019. That is pretty much a year before uh, COVID hit. Um, you voted uh, unanimously, all three committees, to approve what you're calling a modified flip of school start times, which were to start during the 2021 school year. And again, I have my notes here that that was a hybrid year uh, for the district. And you can see the start times up there. I know you've been living this. Elementary schools were to start no earlier than 7.50, and there are your times, 7.50 to 2.15. <laughs> And your middle and high schools at the region to start uh, no earlier than 8.35 and your final times were 8.35 a.m. to 3.10 p.m. Next slide, please. 
So this was, again, your research that was done was sleep research. And based on the American Academy of Pediatrics Associated Research Outcome Study of 2014, it comments on adolescents in crisis because their sleep needs cannot be met given the current school start times. Adolescents' unique biological sleep cycles cannot be behaviorally adjusted. So what was your process? So you actually began, again, initial investigations during the 2015, 2016. So you're talking almost seven years ago. You convened a task force in the fall of 2018 uh, under the direction of Superintendent uh, Andrew Keogh. You collected uh, lots of data from surveys with your um, elementary, middle, high school, family, staff, students, over 1,800 participants. I think this is amazing that you conducted over two dozen stakeholder meetings through open uh, coffees, including six at your elementary schools. You presented on community cable. You engaged in one-to-one -one discussions with, with renowned sleep experts, uh, Dr. Uh, Chuck uh, Zeiser uh, and Dr. Judy Owens. And you also made presentations at three of your joint school committee meetings. Your decision and your rationale. So again, you went with the earlier start times for the elementary. It was more in line with the circadian rhythm. And this is uh, Dr. Eric Azu, Harvard Medical School, 2018. Another decision, the malleability of sleep schedule at a younger age. And there is scant research on a correlation between elementary school start times and outcomes for children. No research supporting later time as the most ideal time for younger children. But later adolescent start times had support, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. An adequate opportunity for adolescents to obtain sufficient sleep on school nights. Optimal alertness in the classroom environment to facilitate peak academic performance. Uh, adolescent mental health and psychological well-being and reduced tardiness in school absences to foster improved opportunities for learning. So this is obviously what you're decision was based on. This was your rationale. Next slide. And at this point, I'm going to hand this over uh, to you, Kate, to uh, talk about the task force. Great. So in 2019, um, 2020, um, those task forces, uh, there were five groups that were meeting um, to really, in, in this slide, we really just boiled it down to some of the main focus areas of the subgroups. Hours and hours and hours went into this work, but um, there really was some, some great things that were done and, and some things that were focused on. So for transportation, which was um, quite a big, uh, a, a big topic, we had the goal of um, having the elementary pickup um, times no uh, earlier than 7 a.m. We have been able to do so in 18 out of 19 buses um, at 7 a.m. or later. And um, the Boston bus, uh, especially at the region, was a big topic of discussion. And we have been, um, we had one route that we remained with one route. And we have had at both the middle and the high school, um, some creative morning programs that students have been able to access. Before and after school programming was a topic for a subgroup because uh, just wanting to think about the availability of uh, after school programming, before school programming for the things that would impact the start time. Uh, one thing that we haven't really been able to collect very much um, data, and we'll talk about the metrics in a moment, but one thing that we have observed is that there has not been an uh, impact on participation that we've seen for before or after school programming. Looking at school schedules, one of the things that we talked a lot about was the uh, middle and the high school, uh, what's going to happen when the day ends later, will students access support? So we have incorporated um, flex blocks and age block supports that have allowed for um, supports for students. And it's also allowed us to have a lack of disruption for um, some of our athletic or our, um, our groups that need at times an earlier dismissal. Staff implications. So when we spoke with staff around this shift in, in, some, of the, in some of those focus groups that we, we conducted, a big piece that was asked for and we were successful in negotiating was for the region to have 
staff meetings ahead of the school day, so before school, and that happens with faculty meetings, department meetings, and then for the elementary to um, remain after school for those for those pieces. So that was the big the big implication and, and feedback from staff. Communication really is ongoing. So this was more to talk at each pat at each moment what we need to communicate out to the community, and um, we will be doing a lot of work moving forward with this as well as we continue to collect data and continue to present information to the community as it's collected. This is a timeline that um, Kathy uh, mentioned a little bit as well, but really this starting in um, this 2018-19, looking at all of the, the feedback and the decision to, to begin in the um, fall of 2020, um, in the school year 1920, the, the subgroups really looking at the, really the challenges and as I had kind of, kind of gone through in the last piece, really what should we be focusing on and what can we really expect? Um, so actually in the school year 2020, 2021, we were in stranger times than we had planned when we were going through, but we did implement the change in start time uh, in the current school year that we're in right now. Um, with full in-person learning, we are definitely living it and experiencing it and, and have made um, many strides in, it, in this school year and year two. And then we look to the school year next year to really be able to tackle some of the data collection that we had hoped for, um, knowing that each year has been a little bit of a surprise, but hoping that we can have some metrics that feel like they have less of a COVID impact and have to be explaining away some of the struggles that our students are having that may or may, may not have to do with school start time. So speaking of that, uh, we have been talking a lot with the leadership groups around the things when we had been talking about this shift, what we wanted to look for, how will we know, um, you know, this was something that the things that we were hoping to see are there. So looking at sleep time, uh, academic achievement, social emotional wellness, I'm sure as I'm saying some of these things, people are thinking, you know, that's gonna be really hard to look at as we're in this time where we talk so much about this just with the pandemic and, and things available to students overall and how students are experiencing. We're going to continue to look at this information um, and whether, you know, what, what kinds of things we need to be putting into place. Um, and looking at late arrivals, early dismissals, some things um, we expect changes in and some things um, we do not. So collecting that data. Student discipline had been something that we um, that had that could have an impact. And then involvement in after school activities. We have a little bit of an insight into that just as far as we have not seen a dip uh, at the moment, but just to continue to, to look at that information how we are going to collect this information. We have a lot of it readily available to us through our information system of Aspen. We have uh, been using the Panorama uh, platform this year for our social emotional surveys. So we uh, plan to survey um, students three times a year moving forward each year. We began last year doing it once, this year we will be doing it twice. And so we will, we will continue to collect uh, data through that. And also some of our intervention data is lives in Panorama as well. And we will continue to um, receive uh, feedback from lots of different groups that we have been in contact with and communication with all along. So that is our update. Thank you, Kate and Superintendent Smith. Any questions? Oh, I see some hands. Okay, Judy. Yeah, Kate, thank you so, so much. Um, that was a great presentation. And I remember at the time, like right around the time we made the decision to, to change the school start times, there was someone at some university in the area who was gonna 
help us with doing the survey or with data collection for a survey, you know, and then obviously COVID hit. And, and so does anyone remember that? Kate, do you remember it? I remember you? that. I was telling Kathy that today. <laughs> actually. Okay. Um, Good. I'm, so what you can tell me what you can tell me about that. But I don't I don't have a great update as to where that group stands. I know Andrew had had that conversation. Yeah. I don't know, Don, if you have any. Yeah, I, I think the issue came down to the grant didn't get funded. It was a it was a grant opportunity. And I think it sort of did not get the funding they anticipated. And so that's why it never really happened. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Thank you, Kate, for um, that update. And um, I, I have to say the start times decision predates my involvement in school committee, though, you know, as a, an involved parent, I certainly was, was watching at the time. Um, and I sympathize because I don't know how you begin to disentangle the effects of the fan pandemic from the, you know, any effects um, that might be experienced um, by students and families um, from the start time changes. I guess I would say anecdotally, my um, impression from families has been that many have adapted to the change. Um, however, there are definitely elementary families that struggle um, with the earlier start time. I think everyone is supportive of it for the, the middle and high school um, students and recognizes the need and that it's a biologically driven issue. But I think that there are many elementary families that are still um, left, especially families with working parents, um, struggling to, to cope with um, the early start time. So I guess I'm going to ask, are there any is there anything that you can share with us at this point from the data? recognizing, you know, the complicating, extreme complicating circumstance of the pandemic um, makes it difficult. But are there any trends that you're seeing um, suggesting that this is something that's going well or not going well um, for elementary folks in particular? I saw Deb on here before, but I don't think she's here anymore. Um, I, I think that that again has been something that we've been grappling with, like what will, what are we going to be looking at for our data points and what, you know, what is that? I will say that with the pandemic that we have lived through, there hasn't been very much discussion around. And I, so I do think that as we now are, refocusing and looking at the metrics and, and moving forward with these pieces, we may hear more and we ha may have more information in that. But I will say um, it has taken a backseat a little bit to, to what we have on our um, on the forefront. But I do think that that is no longer the case. And this is definitely something that we want to collect all the data, whether it's muddy or not, and really think about what what it means and and how our students are impacted and I think that that's the the part for us is that um, initially we were hearing a lot of feedback and 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 to to now revisit that and say now that we've had this school year which is you know as no, more normal than last but you know what what is the experience that people are having and and what are some things that we could do to to support some of the things that are that are coming to the surface? So I will say I, I can't. We were trying for this for tonight to say, is there anything that we kind of have at our fingertips that we can really and just it didn't. There weren't things that felt that they were connected enough to the school start time to feel like that's fair to to present. I, I appreciate that. And I, I do think it's important to follow through on the commitment that was made at the time to study um, this and to, and to, to watch in particular for, um, you know, any, any ill effects on, on elementary kids. So I appreciate your efforts um, to zero in on that when hopefully we have 
more time and energy to do so um, in, in the hopes that the pandemic will be in the rear view. Absolutely. So thank you. I think the one thing that we have talked about at the elementary level though, is that we can look at our parties and we have not seen an increase in tardies. Uh, so you would think that that could be something that you would see if parents are letting their children sleep longer. So I think both elementary principals have said they're not, they have seen no change, um, at least at that data point. And I think at least this year, that would be a pretty good data point for us. Thanks, Don. Okay, I see Amanda. Hi, thanks, Kate. Um, I just wanted to, um, to kind of bring up at the time that really the, the decision was made and then the pandemic struck, the communication subcommittee was working on, um, and Judy, you'll remember this, a panel, a parent education panel on sleep hygiene. We were bringing together um, local pediatricians, sleep experts. Um, we were considering partnering, partnering with Challenge Success to help educate families about what um, good sleep habits look like and how to um, create family schedules that were healthy for everyone and gave people you know, enough sleep and enough family time. So that is something that I think we really should consider revisiting, um, you know, if not in the fall, in the winter next year, just to, to um, ensure that, that our community has the information they need to make healthy decisions for their families. Thank you. Uh, Colleen. Thank you. I actually, thank you, Amanda, for that. I was going to suggest, um, possibly a parent academy um, on this topic, because um, I think there is a lot parents can do um, in terms of structuring the evenings before the morning hits. Um, and I think parents could probably use some support in that, especially at the youngest ages. Those of us who are living it, it's, it's the struggle is real. Um, you know, it's those, the mornings come very early. Some of us, you know, my kid still isn't home from baseball. It's eight o'clock. You know, he needs to be going to bed, my third grader. So, you know, it's the sports play a big part of it. Um, maybe this is something we need to work with the sports and the, you know, the town sports on, you know, elementary age kids should not be getting home from practice at 8 30 PM. It's unhealthy. Um, no matter what time they need to get up, you know? So anyway, I think, I think we need to be looking at this this holistically. I think the data is really muddy. Um, looking at these data points is really hard for me to see any that are sort of clear cut. Um, this amount of sleep time, I think is a direct, you know, data point, and we should be surveying families individually. Um, I think bus behavior has been an issue at Chickering this year. Um, so maybe they're on the bus, but who knows what state they were in when they got on the bus and what state their family is in. Um, so I think we need to be doing more of a survey with families, um, maybe some open forums where people can voice their concerns and their questions and get some more education. But I think a deep dive with the families is actually what we need to be doing. Data is data, I'm a huge supporter of data, um, but when it's muddy, it's muddy and it's not useful. So let's, let's try to do a deep dive with the elementary parents and families. Yeah, Colleen, I was gonna um, say the same thing for elementary families as, and also to hear feedback from the um, parents of older children. I think to have some more of the coffees and the things that we did pre-COVID would be really helpful. Jeff. Thanks, Kate. Uh, just a quick general question on the, on the school start time. I'm imagining, I, I, I wasn't on school committee um, at the time. I know the under, I understand the decision for the high school and middle school to start later, and we needed to swap with the with the elementary school. But I'm guessing that comes down to a budget decision at at a point in time. How does anybody remember what the cost was to have to run basically double the amount of buses? I guess if we so, weren't able so, to share the buses. Yeah. So Jeff, it, it wasn't a, a it, it's a budgetary but not a budgetary um, issue even at the pre COVID it was a staffing issue of availability to have uh, 19 buses, we'd have 38 buses. Um, and so, you know, even speaking to Conley, if we had an extra million dollars, they couldn't guarantee that they could double our, um, our capacity with buses, well, obviously with buses, but with drivers. Um, and that would be, a, you know, 
uh, at this point in time, we're so lucky right now that we're, you know, some of you have had emails where we haven't had a bus driver and there's no substitutes here and there. Uh, so as we, even pre-COVID at the school committee meetings, we basically said it wasn't really a money, it was more of a resource um, as far as um, human resources. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful. I was yeah. assuming it was budget, but that makes sense. That That's also a challenge to find people. Right. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, I think this is um, another big topic that, you know, we've as um, Superintendent Smith said, we've been so focused on COVID, we've been wanting to get back to some of these important other issues. So um, glad to be revisiting this. Thank you to everyone who put this presentation together. And I think you've given us, as I said, I'll be working with um, you know Superintendent McCoy coming on board, you know, to share this is great information uh, as we do a timeline for next year. Um, and as you said, and Sarah, you said it best, how do we untangle, you know, with, with COVID? Um, you're, I'm looking at research coming in now about academic achievement, and there is a learning loss. And yet, you know, we hear in the past week, you look at Dover Sherborne, you know, right up there, one of the best schools in the state and nationally. Uh, I'm not saying there isn't learning loss. You know, it's something we're going to have to take a look at, you know, behavior. You know, anecdotally, you know, we are seeing, and this is not just DS, you know, this is everywhere. You know, uh, kids are adjusting. I, I think it's getting better. But, you know, the parent academies, the collecting and doing a deep dive. So this is really great information. And I think what we'll do before the end of the year, and again, as, you know, you start to develop your strategic objectives uh, going forward, you know, and this was already you know, something you were focused on. Uh, this is very helpful for some additional things we can take a look at. And before I finish up, can I take the liberty of just one more time? I did mention this um, two weeks ago when we had our <clears throat> joint school committee meeting, but I do wanna talk about, and something went out to the parents uh, in our community today to talk about the last day of school. So I, I'm sure you're aware that the state requires our students go a total of 180 days. Um, you have always built in an extra day. It's what you pay your staff for. It's how you build your calendar. You also build your calendar with five uh, weather days. It could be something even beyond weather uh, as we've seen. So this year we did have two weather days and that is what we're making up. What that did to us is it took us out of the 17th being the last day of Ju in June, um, excuse me, June 17th, which is a Friday, which would have been perfect. So as luck would have it, that puts us into the next week. Uh, the 20th, uh, Monday, June 20th is Juneteenth. That is uh, now a, a federal uh, state holiday. So our schools uh, are not open. We will come back to make up those two days on Tuesday, the 21st of June, Wednesday the 22nd, which is a half day for all our students. That's our last official day. I want to be careful because we sent a letter out, and I know your principals are sending information out at all four schools, because there are some particular things such as at the high school. You know, when you look at that last week, that is your, you know, final schedule, and it may be different for, uh, again, uh, individual classes, students, et cetera. So that is the official last day. And please make sure uh, parents, school committee members that you're getting the communication, you know, uh, from our school leaders. So I hope that answers uh, that question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So this- I didn't ask, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Kathy, is, is there a need for us to, vote to make that official or is that sort of already taken care of by your announcement in conjunction with Desi and our prior sort of voting on the calendar? I, that is probably the most important thing, Sarah, is you had a prior vote. You built in those snow days, which is exactly what we used. Had we had to go over, you know, we probably would have to come back, but we stayed within those five days, fortunately. So we just had, we had the authority uh, through the school committee of adjusting those 
five days. So we used two of the days and that's where we adjusted it. So I do not believe you have to take a vote. We have sent communication out to all families and the principals will be sending additional uh, information out. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions about that? All right. Great, this brings us to the second read of our public participation at school committee meeting policy. Um, we had the opportunity, Sarah, jump in and please correct me if I'm wrong, in January was our first read. And Lynn, was, you're nodding. Yeah. Yep, okay. Um, so this is the second read. Are there any thoughts, discussions, questions before I call for a vote. Uh, Tracy. Yes, I, I was wondering if we could go through, you know, if anybody else has some concerns regarding the wording here. I did feel some of it, especially in section four, <clears throat> was a little bit concerning. Um, you know, trusting um, parents and um, each other in the community. I thought the words were a little harsh. The section that says, I mean, I, I mean, no offense to anybody who wrote this or towards the chairs or anything like that, but the section that says there are likely to provoke, you know, that are likely to provoke a violent reaction and cause a breach of peace or incitement to imminent lawless conduct or contains obscenities. I think the obscenities part, I kind of understand. Nobody will want to see that, but I don't know that we've actually seen violent reactions or incitement or imminent lawlessness. And I wonder how parents will take this. Um, I did run this past um, a few parents and they were a little bit concerned about the wording. And I'm wondering if we can make that a little softer and if anybody else agrees with that. So the language in this policy is language from the MASC and the MASC right. updated this policy to be more consistent with basically the U.S. Constitution. And so this language comes from sort of the, the First Amendment um, uh, law around what is protected speech and what is not protected speech. And so case law has, has developed basically these sort of carve outs of protected speech. So by law, if speech constitutes a threat um, or is likely to provoke a violent reaction or cause a breach of, breach of peace, that's not protected conduct and it can be um, prohibited. And so- right. right, I know this came from MASK and, and to be honest, I, I've been concerned about some things that come from them at times, um, not all the time, just sometimes. I do feel like the language is just too harsh and I'm wondering if we can um, take out that section, maybe reward it to something that says, um, you know, the chair of the meeting after a warning reserves the right to terminate speech, which is not constitutionally protected because it constitutes something like true threats or contains obscenities. I just think the rest of it is a little too much for our small towns. I, I would I, I would advocate for, and I feel strongly that we need to have the language that's consistent with both law and the MASC model. And I think, mm. I mean, part of the reason that this policy has had to be updated is because it didn't, it didn't reflect the legal language that has been so carefully crafted in the law around First Amendment speech. So I don't, I, I think we would be taking a big risk if we change the language in any way. Um, and I think adopting MASC language provides us with the protection uh, and sort of backing that we would need if we ever had to implement uh, this, these provisions. Mm -hmm. And section three, um, a little bit near the end, comments and complaints regarding school personnel, apart from the superintendent or students are generally prohibited unless those comments and complaints concern matters within the scope of the school board. Um, I do wonder if that also limits the, the, the comfort that the parents may have in bringing something forward if they don't feel like they're being heard. Um, I feel like coming to a school committee meeting is, is the perfect place to, um, to talk about you know, what's going on. I, I feel like a lot of this really is limiting to the parents and, and um, I, I'm, not, I'm not good with a lot of it, to be totally honest. I just think it's a little too harsh. I think there's sections in it also that um, 
and no offense to the chairs, my goodness, I mean, nothing like this, but, you know, allowing the chairs to, um, you know, make a decision as to whether something can be talked about to, to shut somebody down. If there's a concern, it, it could, and I, like I said, I mean, nothing to the, to the chairs presently because I've never seen this happen. But if we get a chair that's a little more, um, say power hungry and they just don't agree with somebody or they don't like somebody in the community, they can just shut them down. And I wonder if that's a little bit biased too. That's not how this policy works. If you read through it, it's basically mm-hmm. limitations I've read through it, around right. the time. I've, I mean, okay. no offense, I've read through it. Okay. Um, and I think it's, I really think it's harsh on the parents. And I wonder if we can soften some of the language here. I mean, I showed this to a couple of people and one of them said that they felt that the bias was in here too. And that was an, that was another attorney, just a friend, you know, nothing official, but I do feel like we should go through this and soften it a little bit. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to help with that, but I'm, you know, I'm not trying to go against the law or anything like that against the constitution, but I do think a lot of this in here is um, upsetting to parents. And I, I think we should listen to what they have to say about what's in here and let them feel like they are part of this community and that they can speak about things that they want to speak about um, at our, our, at our meetings. We don't want to exclude them. We want to hear what they have to say, you know, and I feel some of this excludes, excludes people, makes them feel like they can't talk about certain topics. And I, I don't think that's how we want to present ourselves. I think we want to present ourselves as being more welcoming, to be honest. Judy. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, um, I agree, in, like, wildly strongly, sorry, uh, with um, Lynn. Hang on just a second, guys. I, 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 I could not agree more strongly with Lynn. Um, this, this policy, actually, Tracy, I think, does the opposite of what you're saying, which is, in a sense, it, particularly this paragraph four, ties the chair's hands and makes them not be able to um, um, impinge on someone's First Amendment rights unless they're doing something that is constitutionally unprotected, okay? Um, I, I am... I am, you know, as you know, I'm a lawyer and I am, I think the policy is, is incredibly well drafted. And, um, you know, just because people, you know, a few people don't like something. I mean, if people were really upset, there's no, there's nobody who came to this meeting and, and spoke during community comments. And we did and, get an email though. We well, did get at least one email. Okay, well, um, again, the policy is written to actually protect people's First Amendment rights, not take those First Amendment rights away. And I think that that's that's wildly important. Um, And and I strongly support um, this policy as it is written for all the reasons that Lynn said far more articulately than I did. And I'll shut up and let Angie speak. Angie. Thank you. Um, I I agree. The thing is when you don't name something, um, then you are kind of restricting the rights even more. We've just named those things that would be prohibitive. And I, I can say, probably with conviction that the MASC does retain attorneys and this has been well vetted in their um, procedure. And so what it's trying to do is to outline the procedures. And as for, you know, having to say, well, we don't want certain things said, everything's allowed to be said, but as when you were saying that maybe there are some things that people want to bring up and we wouldn't let them, that's never the case, but there are some things that are protected that we can't talk about with students and with some faculty issues and we do have to respect the parameters that we're in. I mean, you know, people sometimes think that as the school committee, we, we, you know, talk about that, that we have the authority over um, what's taught and what's not um, on the broad scale. Like we don't get into the minutia of what goes into the every day. So we kind of need to have these bumpers on what we, what we bring out and what we hear and also what is allowed to be said And I've never had anyone not be able to say things. And I mean, things have gotten heated before and it's, it's been let out there. Um, But we do have to have those parameters that say when it reaches this threshold, unfortunately, that's not as 
that's not protected. You, you can't say those things. So I, I feel like we need to have these parameters. I'm a lawyer as well. I think if it's not written out there, then, you know, that's, that's where we open up the floodgates and that's where, you know, we can all kind of be in violation of something or other. And we, we don't want that to happen. We want to give people exactly what the parameters are. And the, the, the substance that was updated from the previous version to this was the vague language around what a chair can prohibit that was problematic under the first amendment, which was improper conduct and remarks will not be allowed. Defamatory or abusive remarks will not, will be out of order. That language was deleted because it's too vague and meaning vague as in too broad. And so of this, of this amendment was to rein in what the school committee can prohibit, but at the same time, enabling the school committees to manage their own agendas by limiting speech to what is within our scope of authority. Mm -hmm. It was very carefully crafted in that regard. I just think it's a little bit harsh. And like I said, I showed it to a local attorney and he felt like there was bias in it, but there could be bias, not just, not necessarily with this group, but you know, if, if this moves on to um, other people just wanting to shut other people, other chairs wanting to shut other people down, I've not seen it with this group, but I do worry about approving this and um, people taking this to a point where the parents don't have a voice. The parents don't feel like they have much of a voice in this town. A lot of parents don't, some do, some don't, and they're scared off by things like this. And I don't think we should be doing that to them. I think we should be more inclusive that they should be able to come and say what they want. Of course, you know, within um, not, nothing obscene, obviously no swearing, things like that. But I think this was a little bit um, harsh and shows a little bit of a lack of um, respect for the parents and lack of um, trust. And that's one thing I can't stand is a lack of trust. So those, those are my comments regarding this, um, this document. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Dennis, is that a hand? Yep. Yep. Um, I, regarding paragraph one, how, how did we arrive at 15 minutes? Was it just sort of a, our meetings are generally a certain period of time and we're trying to sort of uh, be expeditious and efficient or any more just sort of background is, is that, how did we it's, get there? It's from the MASC model. And I think that with the MASC, to the extent that they push these out to, you know, districts across the state, it's probably standard practice. Yeah. And I will just add in there. Oh, sorry, Judy. Having, no, you go ahead. Yeah. Having been the chair two separate times, three years apart, um, I, I don't I, I don't have a memory in my time when on on this school committee that we have had to enact that, you know, it's. I think, uh, like Lynn said, it's kind of a boilerplate thing um, to protect school committees from perhaps community comments going for an hour or more, but we, it's at the chair's discretion and we have mm -hmm. not enacted that. Um, we do ask, you know, at times that people don't repeat something that's been said before, but we've even allowed for, for that to happen. Uh, at certain times when we know there's a really important issue out there. But I think the language clearly gives the latitude to enable uh, extending time and there's certain topics. I remember the start time had some relatively uh, long discussion um, sessions as well. So um, it's clear that that's not disallowed. I was just more interested in how did we arrive at 15 minutes? But thank you. Yeah. For work, guys. I agree, Dennis. I think the 15 minutes I haven't seen overrun here. I agree with Kate. I unfortunately have seen it enacted at other town meetings, and it definitely upsets the public when it's enacted. So I would hope that we would not enact this. That was another issue I had with this document. If I may, right, yeah. I, I think that this this piece about the 15 minutes, if I if I'm remembering correctly, this is the one area where we did deviate from the MASC model by adding in language to suggest that the chair 
could have the discretion to go over that. And that's precisely because I think we do value community input. We, we want for people to bring issues um, and concerns to the school committees. We want to hear that. Um, and my hope um, is that the message that comes from this revision is that there is, you know, in, in every attempt to expand um, the, the types of comments that we're seeking from the public rather than to restrict. Um, and that, you know, that includes um, comments that are critical of the school committee, that includes um, suggestions on ways things could be done better um, by us or by administration. Um, but, um, the, the, I think, you know, the intent here is, is good and um, our practice, um, I, I would hope, would not change that we do allow for people to speak their piece. We have to, you know, limit, um, limit time, you know, for any one speaker um, so that things don't get completely out of control, but, um, you know, that we value public participation. That's what the message that I hope comes through here. Thank you, Sarah. Maggie? I, I echo all the things that Sarah just said so well, I won't repeat them, but um, I don't, I know Tracy, Tracy mentioned a minute ago about getting a letter from a constituent, but I didn't get a letter. So I'm trying Same. to figure out what we're talking about because yeah. I didn't get that, so. Oh, I'll forward it to you, Maggie. I'll forward it right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, that's all. I just didn't get a letter, so I didn't know that there were concerns out there about this with the community. Um, that said, I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with the language, so thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Any other questions, thoughts? This is the second read, so, um, oh, Colleen, yes, I see you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just, you know, in terms of parents having a voice and what the co community comments um, during school community, uh, school you know, and school committee meetings, um, I think that it's important to educate the public what those comments are for. They're not actually a time to get answers addressed. They're not time to engage in discussion. It is literally just comments. Um, and on what what the school, you know, what's within our purview. And so I think it's also important, though, that parents have other options for how they're feeling heard, where they can feel heard. And I, I think that you know, forums, public forums are missing in our district. Um, and I think that if parents maybe felt like there were more options for ways that they can get their voice heard beyond school committee meetings, I think that would help with um, some of the dynamics. I agree fully, Colleen. Thank you for saying that. It was something I was actually thinking about um, because of the I, I know I'm using my own words here and I, I don't mean offense to anybody, but because of the harshness of some of the words in here and the fact that there is nowhere else to speak when you feel like nobody's listening, uh, those are my concerns. We don't, we don't sit there and listen to the public at any other time. It has been suggested that we should have other meetings and perhaps if that was written in here or something that, you know, we will have other meetings where these kind of things can be discussed at greater length or um, special interest meetings, something along those lines. I do think people would hear heard. I do know parents are not comfortable coming. They're not comfortable speaking up. It's a small community and they have nowhere else to speak sometimes except for at these meetings. And if we, I'm not saying us now sitting here because I have not seen that, but if we pass this and then in the near future, somebody comes in that's not like the rest of us that allows speaking, et cetera, then we're gonna have a lot of problems, you know? You know, so I agree fully. I have a, can I ask a quick question? Please. Um, so if a parent wants to, bring something up, can't they email the chairs and ask for something to be added on the agenda? Yep, they can email any of the school committee members 
Um, absolutely. It wouldn't automatically be added to the agenda, but they can ask absolutely in a discussion. I mean, it's not like we're telling people that they can't talk. We're just telling people that there's an agenda and we're trying to follow like a specific way of having a meeting, mm -hmm. run, right? I mean, like, I, I, don't, I don't know any business that would allow a board to get together and, and just throw things out there in the middle of a board meeting, there would be limitations on how much a person could speak during a board meeting, right? So how is this any different? I mean, I, I don't, maybe I'm missing something, I'm not sure, but I feel like, um, I feel like as a parent, if I wasn't on the school committee and I want something addressed, I would just reach out to people and say, we should bring this up and keep, you know, keep pushing on it if I felt like it was something that was important. But I wouldn't expect someone to just hear me talk about something that wasn't on an agenda. Um, I mean, we can't be here for 10 hours, right? We're already yeah. here for over two and right, we're right. all doing this as a volunteer thing. We can't expect people to just jump on and, and talk at length about whatever they feel like talking about. I'm not, and I'm really not trying to be rude. I'm, I think I'm yeah. just trying to understand. Uh, I have seen people come in and, and talk at length and, and we do let them. There was the time several students came and we had 11 letters we had to read, et cetera. Like I, I, I'm big on hearing from the public and there has been time and you're right, Gita, they can sell, they can send the emails, but there's times the emails go to somebody and I'm not saying anything about anybody here, but there's times that emails are received and, and the specifics are not discussed. So it really is up to our group to kind of say, well, what can be discussed, what can't, when a parent really wants to talk about an issue, they may have to come here and say, listen, I sent an email, nothing's happening. No one's listening to me. I mean, I feel like I've been in that situation before. And you come and, and you say something because you want the public to know, you want people to know. And I don't want them to feel limited, whether it's by emails that have to be approved to be read or whether it's by, um, you know, um, length of time or, or anything like that. So I, I want them to have more, um, I, want I, to wouldn't, more. I wouldn't want anyone to feel like they couldn't speak up either. I, I think I'm just wondering if there's, you know, maybe, maybe there needs to be a process about, um, handling the emails that are coming in or the, the other, you know, whether it be an email or a call or whatever it is that's coming in from the public, that's a non-agenda item. And maybe there needs mm -hmm. to be um, more of a process on how to handle that rather than changing the, the language here. Mm. Well, maybe that's where Colleen's, um, you know, idea comes in too. We need to be more accessible as a group to listen to things that aren't necessarily on the agenda. I think that's my whole point that I, they should be able to speak about what they want to. And, and it is not a back and forth. I think we know that. I think the community knows a lot of times it's not a back and forth, but we need more of a back and forth. It's been brought up before. A lot of people don't want to do it. I, I'd love to do it. I'd love to sit in front of people and hear what they have to say, truly hear what they have to say and be able to give them answers if they like. So, but we don't do that. You know, I think, uh, so I, I think these are all really good points. And, and I will say that pre COVID we, we did have principals coffees, you know, superintendents coffees. We had things that were in place regularly, whether they were quarterly or monthly. Um, we had different interest groups that would meet. And unfortunately, like so many things, they went to the wayside or they were, you know, restructured because of COVID. Um, I agree with you, Tracy and Colleen, there's a big need for, for those platforms to come back. I think the effort of this um, updated policy is just to make clear, it's not to discourage anyone. In fact, I read it as to be clear and encouraging people of, about how they can participate in school committee uh, meetings. Um, and sometimes we get emails from, from folks and they don't want it shared out and sometimes they do. So that's another piece uh, that we get as school committee members in terms of how do we share what people are emailing to us. Um, Judy, I, I think I had seen your hand up and I jumped in front yes, of you. But, uh, and you, you did so ably and said what I was going to say. So thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, 
I appreciate all of that discussion. If, if there's not any more comment, I'd like to bring this to a vote. Okay. I'll move. So, <laughs> Lynn, thank you. Uh, we need to vote by committee since we're on Zoom. Um, I'd like to invite a motion at the region to accept the public participation at school meeting policy as stated. Maggie Sharon, so moved. Judy Miller, second. Thank you. Um, roll call, Judy Miller. Judy Miller, yes. Lynn Collins. Collins, yes. Maggie Sharon. Maggie Sharon, yes. Angie Johnson. Angie Johnson, yes. Tracy Mannion. Tracy Mannion, no. And Kate Potter, yes. Thank you. Sarah, can I turn it over to you? Sure, I'd like to invite a motion from the Dover School Committee to accept the public participation at school committee meetings policy revision as presented. Colleen Burt, so moved. Thanks, Colleen. Is there a second? Mark Healy, second. Great, we'll roll call vote. Colleen? Colleen Burt, yes. Mark? Mark Healy, yes. Jeff? Jeff Cassidy, yes. And Sarah Gutierrez done, yes. Great. Uh, Amanda, are you leading it for Sherburn? I can. Or sure. Dennis. <laughs> Many. Um, do you want me to go ahead, Dennis? Sure, go for it. Okay. Um, can I have a motion from Sherburn to approve the um, public comment at school committee meetings policy as revised and read? Kita Russo. Sorry, go ahead, Thomas. Squat, so Kita Russo, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, so we'll do a roll call vote. Um, Gita? Gita Russo, yes. Dennis? Dennis Squat, yes. And Amanda Brown, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. Didn't mean to put you on spot, Amanda. <laughs> Thank That's you. Okay. Um, okay, thank you everyone. That brings us to um, our consent agenda, um, which includes the approval of our March 1st, 2022 minutes. Does anyone have any questions or changes to those minutes? I don't see anyone, okay. Um, then at the region, I would like to invite a motion to accept the consent agenda. So moved. Judy Miller. Thank you, Judy. Angie Johnson, second. Thank you, Angie. I will roll call. Judy Miller. Judy Miller, yes. Lynn and Stella. <laughs> Lynn and Stella Collins, yes. Okay. <laughs> Maggie. Are you sharing yes? Uh, Angie. Angie Johnson, yes. And Tracy Mannion. Tracy Mannion, yes. And Kate Potter, yes. Thank you. Stella is Lynn's dog, sorry. She's playing a role. I just thought I'd give her a vote. Okay, um, Sarah. All right, is there a motion from the Dover School Committee to approve the consent agenda? Mark Healy, so moved. Thanks, Mark. Second? Colleen Burt, second. Thanks, Colleen. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a vote. Mark? Mark Healy, yes. Colleen? Colleen Burt, yes. Jeff? Jeff Cassidy, yes. And Sarah Gutierrez, done, yes. Thank you, Dover. Sherburn? All right, I'd like to invite a motion to accept the consent agenda from Sherburn. What's so moved? Uh, Gita Russo, um, second, sorry. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Okay, we'll take a vote. Uh, Gita? Gita Russo, yes. Dennis? Dennis Quant, yes. And Amanda Brown, yes. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you, everyone. Um, we have um, some interesting communications. I hope you had the time to read about the tech annual report and budget. Um, and at this point, unless there is any other business, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Can we I'll adjourn move. in by by everybody polling? I think. Yes. Raise your hand if you'd like to adjourn. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. That was a big agenda, but important stuff. <laughs>